So in fact, I'm just tweeting it now so oh, that okay. it should automatically tweet from there. Let me know has that come through. So Mike, are you on um, are you on Twitter? Yes. I might do it. I might just co I might do this with a bit of a periscope as well. We should be live. Okay. How you doing? Um, we're live now, are we? We are live. We should be. Okay, we're live. This is live now. This is the future, Smile. Welcome to the future. Thank you for joining us. Um, Thanks, Here we go. I'm just gonna I'm gonna periscope this now, just so we got both. What and what's your what's your Twitter handle? Uh, Samaya Keynes, uh, which I might need to spell. Okay. Well, anyway, so we're back live with Periscope. We're now online with a uh, rolling YouTube. Um, situation. Uh, we're, li we're live streaming on YouTube. Uh, I'm joined by Samaya Keynes, who is an economist. Can you just spell, let's, let, if you want to follow her on Twitter because she's brilliant, well, how do we do that? Uh, so you follow me on uh, Samaya Keynes, which is S O U M A Y A, and then Keynes as in Milton Keynes, so K E Y N E S. Or as in the great economist. But anyway, about economists, and you're a great economist, um, you, what if, tell us what you've been doing for the last few weeks. Right, so um, at the IFS we've been doing our uh, analysis of the manifestos, um, so we had a big event uh, a few weeks ago where we essentially crunched all the numbers um, and we, um, so we, what we were really trying to do is look at their specific policies and see how their numbers all added up. Um, and we found some very interesting things. Um, Don't tell which, me, some of the sums didn't really add up. Well, so... So the big message from that exercise was that there, is, there was a lot that the parties weren't telling us. So the Conservatives wanted to cut the deficit by the most of any of the four parties that we looked at, um, but they weren't saying exactly how they would do that. Um, and Labour, uh, so Labour was very vague about how much you would actually want to borrow, um, which meant that it was actually really difficult to tell the precise difference between them and the Conservatives. Um, and it was it kind of difficult again to know if their numbers added up in, uh, in a flood. I must say, I was a floating voter, and it was very hard for me to understand because you hear a lot of numbers being thrown around. You hear a lot of uh, insults and and people suggesting other people are, are going to be apps cutting public services the bone. Very hard to to understand. If you're an economist, and the the numbers didn't even make sense to you, that's pretty alarming. Yeah, so, so I guess what we were trying to do is trying to make it easier to understand. We were trying to spell out what wasn't being said in the manifestos. So we worked out that the Conservatives' plans implied around a £30 billion cut to unprotected departments. Or if you take the cuts that they've seen over this department, sorry, this parliament, then it would be that sort of scale all over again. Um, so really quite large cuts coming. Okay. Um, yeah, so we looked at, uh, if you look at Labour's plans, then to look at, you know, what that would really mean for departments. Um, then actually, we saw that if they borrowed the most that could be consistent with what they've been saying publicly, then that could mean actually very small real-terms cuts to departments. Um, so, you know, so we were trying to create certainty, but, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty around these figures. Um, and it was, you know, a lot of this wasn't being said very clearly. So we've just got a little bit more certainty just while we've been on air, I think. Sunderland Central have, uh, is a Labour hold, not particularly surprisingly, but again, the Liberal Democrats have lost their deposit. It's looking bad for Liberal Democrats, but of course, it doesn't matter if they lose their deposits if they hold on to the areas in which, uh, in the incumbency, the areas in which they're already strong. So there's a few big constituencies coming up soon, which we will we'll be, uh, we'll be hearing all about. Um, Thank you very much. I've got a question. We got a question. Samaya, which is how different really are Labour and Conservatives? And okay. how different were they made a big play in 2010 that they were different? Uh, Have they, did they? Uh, my producer Nathan is asking a very good question here. Is what? How different are, are the two big parties? I mean, we, they, they, they shout a lot about how each how different they are, but really, are they all the same? Tell me. Sure. So. Okay, so this election is really good to contrast with the last one. So if you look back to 2010 and you looked at you know, their big picture plans, actually there wasn't a huge difference in the amount of austerity that the parties were promising. Um, there was a small difference in the speed. So Labour was saying back in 2010 that they would implement austerity more slowly than the Conservatives. Um, but there wasn't really a huge difference in the amount. 
Um, whereas this time, um, now in 2015, there does seem to be a big difference in the amount of austerity um, being promised. So looking at um, the Conservatives' plans, they are saying that they want um, not to be borrowing anything at all by the end of the next Parliament. Um, whereas Labour have said that actually they might be comfortable with borrowing um, as long as it was for investment spending. Um, and because, as I said before, they've been so vague about exactly how much borrowing that means, um, it's difficult to know exactly how big the difference is between the parties, um, but it certainly looks like it's much bigger than it was back in 2010. Okay, well that is very interesting. Now I've got my friend Matthew Ward uh, is coming up here on Periscope. He is a historian a colleague of mine and he has pointed out that the Liberals, both kind of parts of the Liberal Party, both lost their leaders. They were decapitated in 1945. Is it going to be another 1945, another big wipeout for the Liberal Party? We do not know. Um, so man, that was fantastic. Can, you, can we come and talk to you later on? Because it's nice to know someone who actually knows what the heck they're talking about. Sorry, was that a question? Yeah, no, I just say, will you, will you stick with us? Will you stay there and we can come and talk to you later on? Oh, yeah, sure. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to stop, but uh, yeah, and on Periscope now, hello, I'm just going to come and talk to you up here on Periscope. Uh, we are moving over. We have got our live stream working. We are on www.unelection.co.uk. So you can watch all this stuff on that. Uh, and I will do fewer periscopes, but I, it means I won't get as many comments from you guys. So please comment um, at uh, on Twitter at the History Guy or uh, at Unelection, uh, and uh, we'd be good to see you on there, guys. In the any, meantime, have you got any questions on Twitter? Has anyone been asking any questions? In the meantime, a question here saying get, get your dad back on. I'm going to get him back on. We have solved those technical problems. We're going to get him back on in a second. He is too busy with his nose in this book here. Look at that. He, is, he and I have both got the father and son copies of that book. Here's his hardback. But anyway, um, thank you very much. I'm saying goodbye to Periscope now. Excellent. So, but we are still. Two, if we go to our graphic. Let's see, let's get some graphic going. What, uh, time to update our. Hang on, we, our tripod is looking a little bit dodgy. Here we go. Let's update the count. This is what's happening, everybody, in, around the world. So, seats. Number of seats won who's so got, far. Who's got the list? We know that Labour have won. They've won two oh, seats in Sun Sunderland. So, there. No, I think they've won two now. I think two. this is this is cutting edge technology here. Look at that. Boom. There we have two seats won. Our election seats. But there actually, of course, we really know. Well, we actually know what another 200 results are because most of us, well, not most of us, many of us live in safe seats, so-called safe seats, where. The result is clear long before the election. I live in a safe seat in the New Forest. The Conservatives last lost that seat before the Second World War. It ain't going to happen tonight. So uh, we know a lot of uh, we know a lot of the results already. Um, we're going to be talking to people later on. Who are we talking to? We're going to be talking to politicians. Well, actually, no, we don't want to talk to any politicians because you've been hearing from them a lot recently. We're going to talk to some experts. We are going to talk to people who are crunching the data on uh, on Twitter on social media. And we are going to work out exactly what is going on with this crazy exit poll. Crazy exit poll showing a big, a much bigger than expected number of seats for Conservative Party. Still a hung parliament, still a long way to go. And they haven't got any obvious coalition partners. Liberal Democrats have been cut right back to the bone. Only 10 seats predicted. So funnily enough, although this government have it might have increased their number of seats, the first time that's happened to a government in office since Maggie Thatcher's Falklands War election in 1983, it does look like that there's going to be no real partners for them. And so they'll be in a weaker position. Don't forget, they'll be in a weaker position than they were following 2010, where the Liberal Democrats were good partners for them. So keep tuned in, guys. We'll bring it all as it's happening. Uh, thank you very much. Nathan, what should we do? Should we show them a video? Interesting. I don't know.
You are live on an election. Hello, you hear me? Hello, Tourette's Hero. You're live. Hello. How's it going? Yeah, good, thank you. Biscuit. Yeah, good. Biscuit. How are you? Biscuit. Yeah, we're very good. Now, tell us what your view is on what's going on at the moment. Biscuit. Headshot. Biscuit. Well, what biscuit? I biscuit. I've heard loads about what's going on in the last few hours. Biscuit. Because I've um, been doing shows. So I'm not sure what, um, what's happening at the moment. Biscuit. Uh, I'm, I'm there. I'm there. And I'm very excited about it. 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 I'm very so can I ask you, so we got this, it's a bit of a dodgy line, we're going to stick with it if we can. Can I ask you, what are the specific cuts that you have affected you as someone who s suffers from Tourette's? What have you noticed? What are the changes that have happened in your life thanks to the cuts? Yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm, I don't suffer from the rest, I'm familiar with the rest, it has to rest, it enriches my life in lots of ways, as well as presenting big challenges. Okay. Um, but one of the big things that happened um, in the last five years is a few more access to work, okay, which enables me to keep my keep doing jobs and love and I'm doing that. Okay. Um, so that's one thing that I can do. Okay. Um, and the support from the disabled person to keep working, be financially independent, and to keep doing what I love to do, has been severely undermined. Okay. Um, and that's one of the things that I've been able to do. Okay. And that's one of the things that I've been able to do. Okay. And that's one of the things that I've been able to do. Biscuit um, is not responsive, not supporting working to care for people effectively. Biscuit, the independent living fund, biscuit, which isn't something that I'm able to access as an advocate eligible after it will close to you. Biscuit supports most severely disabled people to live independently in their homes, in their communities, and not in residential care. That includes biscuit. Yeah, biscuit. Biscuit, I work with children and young people, and I see daily how much harder their lives are, biscuit, and how social care is undermined, biscuit, and biscuit, I think it's so comprehensive what you lost, biscuit, and, and it's really frightening, biscuit, and as somebody who relies on the NHS, biscuit, if you have been saved by the NHS countless times, biscuit, in tiny ways and in big ways, biscuit, my fear for that, for us as a country, without a health service, biscuit, that is joined up and genuinely public and genuinely run, to um, meet people's health needs rather than the best ticket, rather than the, um, the financial needs of a few companies, um, is a real health need. And so you, uh, and so the news at the in the exit poll, the Conservatives look like they've got a surprise lead. That's not good news for you. It's really sad news for me. And it's just it's, it's really it's really devastating news for me. It's devastating news. Um, I think for the, for the country, it's devastating news. Uh, the things that I feel really proud to have in this country, like the health service, I think it's uh, whether look at whether in another five years' time we will have a health service that looks anywhere near like we have now is already severely undermined. I feel really frightened if that if that is the that is the if that is the outcome. Look at and really look at look at um, look at there's so much to be done in terms of look at, in terms of um. The, the way that people have talked about the perceptions, the perceptions of um, the scapegoating of um, groups, communities, and individuals that I think is really damaging for us all. This get and I'm it's it's been it, the this get exit polls are um, are a frightening prospect, and I really really hope that um, this get that there is a different outcome. This get cat, but this get this get a future devoted to sheep dogs. This get. Well, thank you very much indeed. That is, we're going to keep an eye on it. We got Labour ahead by two seats at the moment, so you never know. Labour, huh? Okay, we got three seats. Labour ahead by three seats. We just heard. Where have they just won? They've just got. Uh, they've held Washington and Sunderland West. Washington and Sunderland West. Those Sunderland people are fast counters. That is impressive. Three quickest constituents in the country. Uh, uh, being updated. there, you go. Updated. Look at that. Boom. <laughs> Boom. Do you know what our budget is for this? Our budget. Zero. I just bought a load of bananas. That's and that was on my own money. This is all. This is this is amazing. Now, if anyone at home like the fantastic uh, disabilities campaign we just talked to, anyone want to Skype in? Let's see if the let's see if the line's good enough. 
Are we going to show these seats that have already been? We have an exclusive here. Okay, we've got so an exclusive. We, we're going to call. We're going to call seats before anybody else. This is actually for real. Okay, we're going to call. How many seats? Two hundred seats here. About, about loads of seats, which we can guarantee the winner, and we can guarantee the winner because they are safe seats. They will not change hands in this election. I live in one, several of the volunteers here also live in them, uh, and uh, here they are up behind me, cities, uh, London and Westminster, there you go, East Hampshire, No, there's no chance East Hampshire going anywhere else. So we've got Tory ones first. Tory ones here, look at this, Henley, Henley upon Thames, no one's voting Labour there. Kensington, one of the safest seats in the country, there we go, Mid-Sussex. New Forest East, that's where I live. And that ain't going anywhere. That last went uh, a party other than the Conservatives before the Second World War. So anyway, Richmond Park, all these seats, they're all going to stay Conservative. And we've got just as many that are definitely going to stay Liberal, including the first three Sunderland seats. But we can tell some things about those seats. Uh, we do know that um, the Liberal Democrat vote collapsed. That might be significant. We don't know until we get more, more seats in. So uh, we're going to leave you with this. We're going to. We're going to. Anyone wants to Skype in? Anyone wants to come and talk to us? Anyone seeing anything interesting tonight? Let us know. Okay, here come the Labour seats. Look at that, Blackburn, Heart, Absolute, uh, Berry, South Caerphilly, Cardiff West. These seats aren't going anywhere. They are solid, solid Labour. Of course, you would have said that about the uh, seats in Scotland before the SNPs incredible surge in this election. The SNP, if the exit poll's right, will win nearly every single seat in Scotland. Uh, and even though they'll get only around half the vote, which is another reason our first-past-the-post system keeps throwing up these strange results. There we go. Labour seats keep coming. Who we got next, Nathan? What's happening next? So, uh, who have we got available? Uh, they say analytics, are they still... Yes. Uh, yes, Fantastic. they're there. Or we could try peach in. Let's go, let's speak to Here are some Liberal Democrat safe seats. Not many. <laughs> there are not many of those bad boys. In fact, we should check if those... In fact, the, uh, we may have been wrong. Okay, it was, it was unprecedented. It may, we may be wrong. I we, hope not. We will check up on those. Uh, right, we are about to speak to... They say analytics who have been looking at sentiment analysis on Twitter. I believe that they will tell us about it. Are we, uh, are we tweeting these guys? Because I'll, I'll happily retweet yeah. them. Okay. Hello? Hello, They Say Analytics, how are you? I'm good, thank you. And yourself? What is happening out there in the big wide world? What are you guys, first of all, what are you doing? What on earth, who are you? What are you doing out there? You're, you're, you're looking at sentiment on Twitter, are you? That's right, yeah. We, we basically are, we are a spin-off company from the Department of Computer Science from Oxford and we use artificial intelligence to keep track of public opinions, sort of, we stream mass opinions. That sounds, good. that sounds good to me. So in, in future generations we'll have no need for polling companies because we've got you guys. That's right. It's, it's sort of interesting that if, if you think about uh, using machines, to, to interpret something that is inherent to human, which is emotions, it sounds a little bit odd, doesn't it? But actually, it, it turns out to be the case that machines are sort of more objective in a way because they, they don't have their own political views at all. They don't come to work every Monday, mo Monday morning and feel uh, uh, sort of embittered and, and, and lazy and sad. They don't have mood swings. So, so in a way, machines give you a better, more objective uh, sort of uh, um, reflection of, 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 of your opinions. I will, I will say something for you guys in, in this, uh, your, your special artificial intelligence lab. You've got a very good broadband connection. It's the best we've had all day, so thank you for that. I can hear you perfectly, I can see you perfectly. I, I expect nothing less. Um, tell us what the sentiment is saying. What, are you, what numbers are you crunching? We basically uh, we started tracking um, the seven um, leaders, the le leading uh, sort of party leaders. So that's Bennett, Cameron, Clegg, Farage, Miliband, Sturgeon and Wood. Um, and we started these streams around seven o'clock, so when the when the voting day started effectively, um, and we <laughs> so much and, and and obviously um, what happens during the day is different from from what happens when when, when the uh, the exit poll comes out, and we are seeing huge differences in terms of uh, these sort of uh, charts uh, going through the roof um, <laughs> around eleven o'clock, which is one hour after the exit poll uh, took place. So earlier in the day, it, it was clear that Milliband was causing, uh, uh, basically, he, he, won, he was winning, in the process of winning the battle, in that he generated uh, the most tweets, and they were also relatively positive for him. 
Um, Farage did very well as well, and Cameron actually was sort of a, a doing okay, but not dominating. Um, come, uh, when, when 11 o'clock came, uh, one hour after the exit poll, we started seeing um, a sort of huge changes, obviously, because, uh, because of what the exit poll said. Um, Cam Cameron's sentiment ratings started to improve dramatically. And at the same time, um, obviously, people who do not like Cameron started to express fear and anger. So he, the anger ratings and, and fear ratings and frustration ratings around Cameron uh, shot through the roof as well. Wow, that is, that's fascinating. That is pretty interesting stuff. Is this? Are you able to kind of predict uh, predict outcomes with this, or are you just monitoring what's going on? You just got your finger on the pulse of the British people at any one time. That's right. Yes. So, so our, we, our our primary goal is not to predict the winner, although um, it turns out to be the case that sentiment is a, is and emotions are uh, can make it a relatively good proxy for. A straightforward betting who is going to win who is going to lose um, but obviously uh, one, one is to keep keep in mind that uh, Twitter is just it's just a s sort of subset of all the emotions that are out there so uh, trying to trying to extrapolate who is going to win on the basis of um, even 200,000 tweets you can get a reliable bet but that's not our main focus because we are effectively it's just a sub signal okay Great stuff. Thank you very much indeed. That is uh, that is absolutely fascinating. Look at looking at some of these graphs. So yeah, we, we can see the graphs. So, throughout the voting so we can day. see these graphs here. Sentiment throughout the voting day. The Tories had a very bad afternoon by the looks of things. In fact, no one had any sentiment going on. Everyone was just had the mid-afternoon slump. Actually, speaking of which, are people a lot angrier in the morning or the evening? What what does this tell us about the general people's sentiment uh, on any day of the week? Well, it, 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 if you look at the entire week, for example, um, uh, you, you will see this circadian cycle. So people waking up, people uh, going to work, having a lunch break, getting, uh, getting back to home, um, going to sleep. And so these overall cycles are always going to be there. But in this case, it seems that, as you said, uh, during midday, there, there was a bit of a sort of quiet period. Um, and then um, it, uh, we're starting to see a huge, huge uh, sort of surge in, in volume as well. Although soon people will go to sleep, and it will it will be seen the next morning in these graphs as well. Wow, we, yeah, a lot of people are in bed. A lot of people don't know what's waiting for them when they wake up today. That's <laughs> oh, right. yes. What about this one? We're looking at humour. So humour, people are being funny. Humour tracks anger by the looks of things. So people are angry, but they're also funny at the same time today. Yes, and it's really interesting. So if, if you look at these statistics and these figures in proportional terms, um, at some point. Up to 60% of all tweets about and around Farage contain some amount of humor. And that, 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 that is astonishing, because if that's the case, you, you, obviously this is just a statistical interpretation, but even if it's uh, sort of half correct, then a large proportion of tweets aren't serious at all, and that tells something about how people uh, sort of view this, this uh, election and politics in general. It's, it's a laughing matter to quite a few people, which obviously is a great source of amusement. Now we got this one here which is surprised through the day. Why on earth is everyone so surprised with Nigel Farage? Did I, did I miss something? Did he do something weird this afternoon? Uh, th that indeed caught our attention as well and we looked into the data and obviously that there's quite, quite, quite a bit of data but um, there seems to be a number of tweets around five o'clock this afternoon about uh, Farage's teeth. Uh, someone made a comment saying that uh, whether he, uh, he, he it is unclear whether he can keep his teeth because they are not white. Okay, well there you go. <laughs> Which, so there's an example. I'm surprised of by that too. Yeah, that's an example of where a single tweet can influence these scores. So a single tweet, if it gets retweeted heavily, uh, you, you'll see peaks and troughs in the graphs uh, uh, shortly after. Okay, brilliant. Well, listen, thank you very much. That is fascinating stuff. Um, thanks for joining us on An Election. See you next time. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Look at that. What a legend, eh? What we need is a few more clever foreigners who crunch data with good broadband connection in this country. Then we'll be fine. Um, right, what's happening next? Oh. Trying to get Peter. Oh, okay, we're trying to get my dad. I may have to ring him in the old-fashioned way. Hang on, I might do that. Let's get him up. Let's get him up. Put something on. Uh, 
Um, let's introduce your hung parliament video. It looks like a hung parliament. Okay. Hey, I'm back. I'm back. It looks like a hung. It looks like a hung parliament. Uh, just. Uh, which is what everyone predicted, uh, and it's what I predicted quite a lot, so I'm very happy that it's on Parliament, because it it, I don't like being wrong about these things. But we made a uh, video uh, for the Alternative Vote campaign, that was a few years ago now, and I really don't like to say I told you so, but I told you so. Ah, the British electoral system. Decisive, strong, so watch simple to use, that, that was, and effective. See, if we had a decent, if we had a decent internet, I didn't know you did so well. Yeah. This whole thing was the most voted in the survey of the election. It's true, it's we are ahead of more than the others because of how we vote. If we look at the years 1910 to 1929, the British had seven general elections. Five of them ended up in home parliaments. And, and that was under that's good old first past the post, always get a decisive result. And those home parliaments were caused by well, our own selfishness. We insisted on voting for parties outside the big two. I could unstrap my thing. We lost our voting for this little fringe party called the Long Wash Party. As a result, the vote was all split and the home parliaments time after time. If we just vote the now I can do the lovely electoral system might deliver what you did in 1951. Only 97% of us voted in the Conservative or the Labour Party. I can hold up your Mac. In the 2010 general election, 65% of us voted for the Conservative or the Labour Party. Everyone else voted for someone else. As a result, we got a whole part. So thanks to our own selfishness, we're going to end up with more hung parliaments. That's a complete disaster. I mean, look what hung parliaments have done for us in the past. I mean, during the 19 teens and 20s, when we had hung parliaments regularly, the government was providing a balance. What's key, guys, is when we do a thing. It won the First World War and it laid the foundations of the welfare state. Yes, Mother of all time, turns the oldest and greatest democracy in the world. How can you improve the perfection? Well, one prime minister who thought the British system was perfect was the Duke of Wellington. That was nearly 200 years ago. He decided he said he couldn't imagine a more perfect system. And that was a time when women couldn't vote. Okay, but guys, when, 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 when you tweet something, you yeah. yeah. tell me I'll retweet that. That's how we're going to get more to two votes on it. So and say if we, we it was so good that last segment, but I didn't retweet it. Because uh, I, 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 was looking, I, I went out to frame, to frame right and I was looking for they weren't uploading our constitution. It's very reactive. We introduced numerous bills to enfranchise more and more of the population. We've also cracked down on multiple voting. Until 1948, you're able to vote in more than one seat if you're a university graduate or a property owner. The fact is our constitution is always changing and there's no reason it can't change to accommodate our new desire to choose between more than two parties. Okay, we're back in. Sorry about the sound. Would people like us to but we'll, we'll run that film We're again. back in. Sorry about the sound. We'll run that film next because I'm sure you're desperate to watch it. Um, uh, any comments you've got, please let us know uh, at uh, periscope. Dot, and at, just at, per, at, at periscope, at on election, uh, or at the history guy where I am. And uh, feel free to join in. Anyone doing anything interesting, let us know. In the meantime, we're going to try and get my dad, veteran newsman, on the phone now on the skype let me see now here he is i'm trying to get him up trying to get him up where are you dad where are you yeah tom i just <laughs> they, everyone's complaining because they could hear us i think i don't know there's many people watching this but i think most of them are related to me so uh hello to all of you uh barnes home i'm ringing dad this is high tech here now what's going on Uh, he's, he hasn't got a Twitter handle. Okay, hi Dad. We'd love you to come back onto Skype now. We've sorted our technical problems out. Okay. Here we go. Right. Okay, now. Now, people, people may ask, why, why do we not have a swingometer? But swing is a thing of the past, is it not? What's your, what's your take on that? Okay. Tweeting down. Okay, uh, here we go. Thank you. Later on. Well, 
Call him? Yeah, call him. There we are. Hello. Hello, Dad. Hello, hello, Dad. <laughs> hello, young man. Hello, how are you? Very well, Dad. Very well. Now, how, every, every, I hope the sound is better for everybody at home. Now, let us know on Twitter. The sounds better. Dad, okay. what's going on? What's going on here? What's happening? It's five ways extraordinary, isn't it? I mean, we've got this. Uh, We've got uh, Cameron looking like being Prime Minister again without, frankly, much problem. Uh, and he may not even need the support of the DUP or the Liberal Democrats, who, by the way, seem to be losing seats left, right and centre. I think the key thing that's happening is you've got UKIP doing very well. We want to know where UKIP are taking the vote from. Is it from just the Liberal Democrats? Or is it Conservative and Labour as well? It looks as if it's obviously some of them Conservative and Labour as well. But not very much. It looks as the Liberal Democrats are the big losers, certainly in the North East, the results we've had in. What now, the other interesting question is whether the North Eastern seats we're seeing, which are seats in which the Labour Party are doing rather better than they did in 2010, are going to be typical of the whole country. The exit poll says no. The exit poll partly, by you, says no. It also says that the Liberal Democrats are going to do appallingly badly, even in the seats they did rather well in 2010. If that's the case, then the reason that the Conservatives have 316 seats forecast from their 306, 7 odd seats before is because they're taking Liberal Democrat seats rather than Labour seats. So what we may see is the Conservatives moving ahead because the Lib Dems are handing over seats to them, whereas Labour are actually gaining the odd seat. But because of Scotland, of course, they've lost this huge number of seats, 50 odd seats in Scotland. So it's fascinating. It's still very exciting, isn't it? But so, Dad, the reason uh, we haven't got a swingometer here, apart from budgetary issues, is because we wouldn't really need a swingometer, right? I mean, this is. Oh, you've, okay, you've got a little tiny swingometer. How much swing has there been? Has it hardly been any, has there? Well, there's been a 2% or 3%, but I don't know, in the seats that we've had in so far, there's been a 2 or 3% swing to Labour. And that's because we're looking at seats, apparently, according to the exit poll, in the northeast where Labour's doing rather well. So the question is, what's happening in the marginal seats? We've had some, the, th the three Sunderland seats we've had in have not been typical. They've been strong, safe Labour seats. What we need to see is what's happening in the marginal seats where Labour and Conservative are fighting it out and each of them might win them. That's what, that's, those are the key seats that matter. The seats like, uh, there's none Eaton coming up. There's all sorts of other seats in the Midlands and some in the North and of course many in London where there are very close fights between Labour and, and, and Conservative last time. Who's winning there? Is that a little swing to the Conservatives or a swing to Labour? The trouble is it doesn't, in a sense, really matter if the exit polls are anywhere near right, because the loss of the, the Scottish loss for Labour is so huge that they really can't, just can't chase David Cameron, who is winning seats from the Liberal Democrats. So it, David Cameron's got it, got it made all ways if, if that exit poll's anywhere near right. I keep saying if the exit poll's near right, it's terribly boring to think about the BBC programme. Well, all, all the MPs that they talk to, of course, say, oh, I don't believe the extra power, it's all nonsense, let's wait for real results. So it's quite true, we have to wait for real results, and they're in the marginals. Well, Dad, we'll come back to you through the evening. Thank you very much indeed. Do, do, do. Bye-bye. See you later. Right, Nathan, when are, uh, when are the marginal seats coming in? We need to, here are the predictions, by the way. Look at that. I mean, very few people would have guessed that. Um, that either the pollsters were wrong or the British people changed their mind at the last minute. Absolutely extraordinary. So anyway, that's my dad. He did his stuff. Um, we have got other guests coming up. We've got other people coming. But if you want to come onto this program, if you've got something to say, if you happen to be an expert in uh, constitutional arrangements and whether or not the Conservatives can govern with a uh, very uh, in, a, in a minority government, whose votes they're going to rely on? Perhaps some of these votes in Northern Ireland. DUP zero. I'm surprised to see that. Um, anyway. That just is not covered by the exit poll. Oh, the DUP is not covered by the exit poll. So that zero, uh, don't we worry. Don't worry table, too so. much about that. They're, they're going to win 10 or so seats, I think, uh, if last time's endings go by. Um, but we have, we'll keep you updated as the night goes on. I'm going to test you on some trivia, Dan. Okay, I'm getting tested on some trivia now. the next guest. Um, what was the lowest turnout in the general election constituency? Lowest turnout in the general election what constituency ever? Well, I mean, that's... No, looking it up. No, I'm not looking it up. I'm just seeing if, seeing if, uh, how, what, what news on the election. 
Um, right. I've absolutely no idea. What's the lowest turnout? It was 29.7%. 29.7%. That's shocking. Lambeth, 1918. Na Lambeth, 1918. Ah, well. The old coupon election, whatever it's called. Yeah, okay. okay. And highest turnout? Um, I don't know. Hang on a second. Cheat, cheat. No, uh, I've no idea. What's the highest turnout? Come on, guess. I think the highest turnout was 97%. Not quite that high. 89.1. Ashton-under-Lyne, 1928. The highest turnout in the history of UK general elections has been 89%. Yeah. That's surprisingly low, I would say. ashton under -Lyme. Well, well done to them. Um, should we go the way of the Australians? But I, I, we should we go the way of the Australians? Should we have mandatory voting in this country? Let us know. You can tell us. I personally don't think it should be mandatory. I think it's weird to sort of punish people for not voting, but I think we should be allowed to vote digitally. We should be allowed to, uh, to encourage to vote postal vote. I always postal vote now, it's much simpler. And uh, we have to also create a voting system that actually helps people realise that their votes can actually translate into to electing these people. The, one of the reasons the turnout is very high in Scotland during the referendum is a simple question, a yes-no question, and they knew every vote would count. If you live in a constituency like mine, the New Forest, not every vote counts, so it's, uh, it's probably sometimes not really worth voting. So we're going to go to a video, we'll go to a that, video now. Um, Jay was talking about earlier. Oh yeah, we had Jay in the studio earlier. Check out my why Periscope. Vote, He's a total dude and uh, it's why people don't vote. It's his take on it. Hope Jay's watching tonight. Good luck to you, buddy. So, you're one of the 42% of people in the UK who don't intend to vote in this year's general election. Fair enough, maybe you're less than 18 years old. In which case, your time will come. Or maybe you're in prison. Or maybe you're the Queen. If you're the Queen, it's your Parliament and you're not allowed to vote. That still leaves a whopping 13 million people who are eligible to vote, but have said they're not going to. The press call it voter apathy, but that term implies that non-voters are lazy people who would rather stay in bed than walk five minutes to the polling station. The truth is even sadder. A lot of people are informed, passionate and clued up, but have chosen for their own reasons not to join in. What legitimate, decent, well-thought-out reasons could they possibly have? It's fun to fantasise and imagine that your one vote could tip the balance and change the result of a general election. Realistically, of course, that never happens, except one time in 1910 when Henry Duke Baron Merivale won the seat of Exeter by a margin of one. Much more likely, you live in a constituency that's nowhere near as marginal as that, and it's pretty obvious who's going to win. We have a far from perfect first-past-the-post process for picking future politicians, and it can feel like it's f***ing pointless. This is especially true if you like one of the smaller parties best. And that brings us to reason number one why people don't vote. My favourite has no chance. OK, fine, fine. Maybe, maybe you can't change who your MP is going to be. But you can change their behaviour. How? The way parties behave in government is down to far more than just the election results. It's down to the election details. The morning after the general election, all the stats of how many voters voted for whom and where are there to be seen on the internet. And the party leaders are watching very carefully. Every vote for a small party is a vote taken away from one of the big ones. And the big ones will do everything they can to try to win you back. Don't believe me? Just look at the Green Party. Before the recent surge of support for the Greens, Labour had no intention of renationalising the rail network, but afterwards they did. Where do you suppose they got that idea? It's the same for purple patriotic pound-pushing potty mouths UKIP. The more votes anti-immigration party UKIP get, the more Labour and the Tories move immigration up the agenda. Well done UKIP voters. Perhaps it's not the smallness of your party that's stopping you from voting. Perhaps it's the opposite. Could it be you're not voting because... My favourite's going to win anyway! Well, it seems really obvious, but what if everyone thought the same as you? Let's say everyone in your constituency thought your MP was really safe and there was no need to vote. Think that can't happen? It's exactly what happened in 1997 to Government Minister Michael Portillo in 1997 when he famously lost his so-called safe seat. <laughs> also, there's a big difference between winning by miles and winning by a hair's breadth. If your MP gets a thumping majority, they'll be more confident about their convictions. And presumably, if you like them, that's what you want. On the other hand, if they just scrape in, they'll be forced to compromise and pander to voters who never liked them in the first place. 
So you see, first past the post is far from perfect, but there is no such thing as a wasted vote. That's so important, I'll say it again. There is no such thing as a wasted vote. Maybe it's not the counting system that's putting you off. Maybe, and I'm sorry to say this is the most popular reason of all, your reason is... I HATE ALL OF THEM! For many people, after reading all the manifestos and watching all the party political broadcasts and browsing all the party websites and enduring all the TV debates, they've decided that not a single one of the parties speaks to them, and they don't even unhate the least worst one enough to give them a tactical vote. If this is you, rather than remove your voice completely, why not do something that's more productive and more fun? You can vote none of the above. In some countries, that's actually a box you can tick, but in Britain, you do this by spoiling your ballot. The rules of the ballot box are strict. You put an X and nothing else to make sure that there's no chance of error or fraud. If you put a tick, or colour the box in, or rate the candidates out of 10, or correct the spelling of the candidates' names, or put your own name and vote for yourself, or put your own name and vote for someone else, or write the lyrics to the Stonecutter song from The Simpsons, that's called a spoilt ballot and it won't be valid. But it will be counted. Politicians will see the none of the above votes and they're much more likely to try and win you over and much more likely to try and fix the system if you've bothered to go out and vote. Spoiling your ballot is an absolute worst case scenario, last, 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 last resort, but it's so much better than not voting at all. It's totally understandable why people think that there's no point in voting. But if you do go out and vote, there is one thing that you're absolutely guaranteed. When you and your friends are bitterly complaining that the country's been piddled up the doo-wop by a prime minister you hate and a party you can't stand, you can at least take solace in the ability to smugly shrug and say, well, it wasn't our fault. Okay, Lena, here we are. We've got you now. Hi. H how you doing? Can you, and how's that working out for everybody? Closer to you. Closer, closer to, you, to you. Closer to you. Closer to me. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so there we go. Cheek to cheek. Uh, this cheek to is cheek. high tech. We're now cheek to cheek in the studio here. <laughs> um, can you please tell the lovely people at home who you are and why we are talking to you today? Okay, um, well my name's Dr Elena Kilby, um, I'm a researcher and lecturer at Cardiff University School of Journalism and as of uh, the dissolution of government and the election period, what we've been doing, um, a small team of us in the university, is conduct a study of broadcast news media, so from the 30th of March up until yesterday evening, just focusing primarily just on broadcast news in the evening. So it's Sky, uh, Channel 5, the BBC, Channel 4 and ITV. And what have you discovered? Where's the bias? Well, we've, we've had... Oh, well, I mean, I don't want to kind of go there with that because we have had to be really careful in terms of how we analyse um, these kind of the different programmes. Um, but one of the kind of the, the major things that we found in terms of the amount of coverage is dedicated to, well, election stories is, at the moment, what we found is, in terms of the findings, up until I think it was probably Friday last week, which was the 1st of May, was that, again, TV is a really important medium in terms of the, po uh, the parties getting their uh, points across, but what we found is most of the coverage so far has been dedicated to coverage on horse race, which is who's ahead in the polls, who's going to win. And also a major thing that's come out in the last few weeks because of the rise of the SNP is the kind of focus on coalition deals. That's kind of the, the two major parts of the coverage that we've found so far. So, you're, so what you're saying is it's, it's kind of obsessing about the, the tactical side of it and not the issues that, that we're actually using to base these votes on. Well, that's the thing. I mean, I, I think in some ways we're we becoming more and more like the American model of election coverage, where it is there tends to be this focus on who's ahead in the polls. And uh, it's, it's slightly disappointing in the fact that, again, I mean, there might be a lot of people that don't really know who they're going to be voting for initially. I mean, this is a very undecided election at the moment, or so the exit poll says something slightly different. Um, but I think... You know, in order for just general citizens to go out there and vote and understand who they're voting for, it's really important for them to know about the issues that the parties are, are dedicating themselves to. So we know that things like the NHS are really important, the economy, schools, 
um, lots of kind of different subjects that have just been pretty marginalised. I mean, the economy was a subject that was quite uh, big in the first week of the coverage, but that's kind of marginalised itself now. Um, but other important subjects um, that I think a poll that The Guardian did were the NHS, education, those kinds of things have just kind of really dropped to the wayside in the last couple of weeks. Yeah, I agree. It's been really interesting, hasn't it? I suppose it is this... We're all a bit obsessed with this kind of American stuff. We've got so many polls out every day and everyone's talking about this poll and that poll. And we, we, we're beginning to I don't know, perhaps obsess about the game of politics, aren't we? Yeah, more than anything now. And, uh, you know, it's kind of, you know, it, it can be quite exciting as we're going along. But I think one of the things that's going to come out of tonight is, I mean, <clears throat> how reliable are polls in the first place anyway? Um, whether it be the kind of the long term polls that have been happening over the last couple of weeks or the exit poll that's happened this evening. Well, that's true, and it looks like also weird shifts. For example, Liberal Democrats doing badly. The Tories have gone up, even though there has been a, a small Tory to Labour swing. So it's it's a very very confusing picture at the moment. Yeah, no, m most definitely. Um, uh, another thing that's kind of been really interesting with the coverage because we've also been looking at sound bites. So the amount of time that's been dedicated to sound bites in uh, news coverage in the in the evening bulletins. And uh, what, one of the kind of findings that we, well, the major findings of, of this particular part of the study was, um, again, a lot of the sound bites tend to be related to attacks rather than policy driven discussions. So. What we found in this particular study was most, I think, 43% of, of the coverage up until last week, so the first, the first of May, was that 43% of that coverage was dedicated to attacks, whereas I think 38% was dedicated to policy, to policy discussion. Now, attacks, I mean, it's not in the traditional sense where they're physically, well, I'm not going to say physically, but attacking other, other party members, but more along the lines of they're actually attacking their, their, their actual policies. Now, a way that's been done that I've noticed with the BBC coverage over the last couple of weeks, particularly when the manifestos were released uh, in the first few weeks, was the BBC would kind of lead with a policy discussion from the politicians describing the, po the, the particular policies within the manifesto, and then that would be followed up then with a rebuttal from the other parties that are kind of criticising the policies advocated by, you know, the different parties. What is the answer? How are we going to get a better political... This is a big question. It's, it's past midnight, I've got a big question for you, but what, it, what, it, what is the answer to getting a better level of political discourse in the modern media world with Twitter, everyone being rude to each other and funny and news every, all over the place? Have you, have you got any answers or do you just monitor it? Um, well, I'm just monitoring, and I don't want to kind of, again, just kind of put my own biases on there, but I, I personally, just as an ordinary citizen, taking the kind of university element out of this altogether, I think it's, it's still important for people to understand what the parties stand for in terms of their manifestos. Now, I know maybe we've become a bit more of a lazy culture now where we can't really be bothered to kind of go and check those things out. But, you know, with TV being a really important medium, still the kind of most important medium, despite social media be being very, you know, another kind of important element as well, it's just the fact that with TV being the most go-to source for, for news in terms of the election, it would be, I think, a lot better if, you know, they could just take some, take some time and contextualise the kind of the different policies and what the, these different parties stand for and maybe kind of take a critical approach to, to, to these different parties as well. Because what we've, another thing that we found is, in terms of sources as well, is, I mean, obviously politicians were the main source uh, of information, that, that's understandable. Citizens come a close second, so lots of vox pops. Um, but again, they, they're not really to do with kind of anything issue-based. They, they kind of attach themselves back to this idea of horse race. So um, when news presenters or journalists are interviewing ordinary citizens, it tends to be around the subject of, well, who do you think is going to win? Who are you going to vote for? And um, same with um, alternative sources as well. I mean, it would be good to see kind of additional sources along the lines of maybe legal, healthcare professionals, um, campaign pressure groups, trade unionists, but they were kind of really low down on the agenda in terms of broadcast news coverage, oh. whereas um, pollsters, which again is it relates back to horse race, academics as well, tend, tended to have the, the kind of majority in terms of alternative votes. But yeah, I completely agree. But a lot agree. of the time it was just to kind of give the bigger picture uh, I completely agree. When, in, on the Today programme, when they have their big interview at 10 past 8, if it's a politician, I virtually turn it off. But when it's in, a historian or a scientist or a, a practitioner, I think, hang on a minute, this, I'm actually going to learn something here. I'm going to learn something fascinating. Well, thank you very much indeed. Yeah.
Um, we really appreciate you coming in on this okay. fantastically clear line you've got here. Well done on your broadband. <laughs> you, whoever your broadband provider is, is a total legend. Um, so thank you, and I'm oh, going to. Okay, well, I'm, I'm on very well. Yeah, should I even say? No, well, no, because I think the 12 people watching this, uh, I don't want to unduly influence them. But yeah, thank you. Uh, keep watching on election the rest of the night. And if you're free, we'd love to talk to you again because you're the best. Thank you. Okay, take care. Bye. Bye. Right. That was, I think that was very interesting. That, that was a look at, um, we are all a bit obsessed, I think, with, with uh, polls. I think lots of people in the Westminster Village, if you like, obsessed with American style, like that Nate Silver at the last American election who called all the states right in Obama's uh, re-election as president. And we're all talking about game-changing polls and these polls and that polls, and probably not enough about issues that affect uh, everybody. What have we got now, Nathan? Uh, we've just tried to connect to Mark Thompson, but ah. he's got an internet. I think, I think, think that's crap. Mark Thompson's crash. Mark Thompson is a, a, a political journalist, we, uh, no, blogger. We, as in our website. Oh. That's what the, uh, our website's crashed? Yeah. In a good way? No, crashed as in... <laughs> people are saying, can't, has, uh, has it crashed, can't access on iPhone or... Do, do you know what? It may have crashed if you've got too many people watching and it's just too hardcore. <laughs> um, okay, it's showing fine for me. Uh, anyway... I'll try. I will try. I'll try. <laughs> Hello. Now I can see you on YouTube. Okay, so the reason we're having technical problems, we think it's because of unbelievable amount, heavy amounts of traffic. I mean, you know, it's inevitable, I guess. Uh, I'm I sure. Did just click 50 times. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Someone just one of our volunteers just clicked 50 times. So uh, just looking at the results here, so we got right? three seats in Sunderland uh, are still still showing up as Labour. Have we got any other results coming in yet, guys? Let me open in. Here we go. Who are we talking to next? Tory boy. Tory boy. Okay. They're going to talk to a Tory here. We're coming up. Um, well, at so the moment, Labour have got nothing to worry about. They're 62. They are, you know, okay, 40,000 votes ahead at the moment. But we're going to uh, play a, a I mean, video. So, Tory boy, very interesting story. Okay, we're going to play a video gonna play, now. We're going to play a documentary. Gonna, we're going to play a trailer and then we're hopefully going to speak to him. Okay, we're going to play a video now by a guy called Tory Boy. He's, here's the trailer, we're going to talk to him afterwards. It is seriously slick, this operation. Go! Up until a few months ago, I was a Labour supporter. So what would you say to people like myself, who, who've kind of been Labour voters all their life, came from a Labour background with Labour parents and so on, but are now deciding to press the, the blue button? Well, you're quite unique, aren't you? The Queen has kindly agreed to the dissolution of Parliament. You're voting for the fresh start our country so badly needs. So I'm now the candidate for Middlesbrough. Ooh. I've just picked up bits and pieces from watching TV. So it's going to be leaflets knocking on doors and just generally making a, a bit of a noise up in Middlesbrough, I think. What's conservative or I kill you! And this is a Labour stronghold, Stuart Bell. Big craggy faced old geezer. Um, he's got a face like a cookie. Do you know who this is? Would you be surprised to know he's been the MP around here for many 30 years? No, oh, I've never seen him. I've never seen Stuart Bell. He's not doing a job that he's being paid for. I think if people did realise that, then they'd probably refuse to pay for it. The mothballing of the Corus steel plant brings to an end 170 years of steel making in the region. Well, Stuart Bell's just a waste of space. He's virtually in semi retirement. What about um, your local MP, Stuart Bell? What about him? I've heard he's living in Paris. He ought to be ashamed of himself. I'm coming for you, Bell. So, Stuart, it's John Walsh here. I'm outside your house, so if you'd like to come out and say hello. Do you, the old you owe people an apology? Who's this gentleman? Oh, he's with me. It's okay. okay. He's with me. Yeah, yeah. As soon as there's an election, his leaflets come through your letterbox, but you never seem to see him any other time. That's Bell. I know it's Bell. You wouldn't consider voting Conservative. Right? I'd rather jazz and vote Conservative. So you wonder how much of this is just banging your head against a brick wall? I want a leaflet to go out, and if it doesn't go out, I'm pulling it out of the campaign. Maybe we should just pull out the campaign. Let's get Stuart Bell in prison by Christmas. Don't 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 are you worried that there might be more people like myself? No, because you're a rarity. Yeah, with respect, you're a rarity.
Sorry, boy, look at that. Yo. Hello, can you hear me? Maybe they're CD ROMs. Okay, now we should be able to hear us. My fault, I thought. Maybe he's got his data on there. Every single constituent. So, did Come you on, Tory about this that the Conservatives opened up? You didn't have to be a party member. Oh, yeah, this is the people's. Uh, well, yeah, this so is. What do you think of that? This is, I, I think open primaries are a great idea. Politicians don't like them because they tend to get uh, con candidates who don't do what they're told. But I think they're terrific ideas. I, I would love to take part in an open primary myself. Um, and we're going to be talking to the man in the empty chair, Tory boys, coming back any time now. Is he cold? He was there only cold. I think he's been here. Here he comes. He's going to come back. Anyway, uh, open primary is very cool. Um, we, uh, we have, we've had a, quite a few actually uh, around the country. You've got one or two in the West Country, one on the West Coast is gone. Hey, how are you doing, Tory boy? Can you hear me? I'm good, I'm good. How are you? Yeah, brilliant. That's fantastic. Um, I really, really like your video. I thought it was very cool. So can you tell me how things are going up there? Say again? I, I think your video was great. Um, and we've just shown it to all of our followers. Uh, yes. Can you tell me how things are going up there? Yes, well, um, I'm not in Middlesbrough at the moment. So I'm, I'm back in London. But um, I think things are going well with the campaign. Simon Clark's the new Conservative candidate for Middlesbrough. So um, I think he's hoping to um, at least take back that second position that UKIP took in 2012 when there was a snap by-election when Sir Stuart Bell died. Um, what, what, is, what hope have we got to try and shake up the political system and try and stop this, this terrible atrophying effect of these safe seats that you've spoken out so strongly against? Well, I think, you know, there's, there's two things that you can do. One is the recall of MPs, which... Um, you know, Zach Goldsmith was in, in favour of, but um, I think if we can adopt a system whereby two terms is your maximum term in a constituency, then you have to move on. Then we won't have these MPs who have a job for life and who feel that they can take the constituents, um, you know, for granted. So, you know, if after 10 years maximum you're in a town like Middlesbrough, then you have to find another seat. I think it will keep things interesting. We probably have a, a, a larger turnover of candidates and of MPs. And that's probably a good thing for everyone. Um, what about your political ambitions? Are you going all the way? What's, what's, what's the next step? Um, well, after I made the film, because I'm a filmmaker naturally, so um, I, I was asked to stand again this time for, for 2020, uh, for 2015 rather, and uh, filming commitments meant that I couldn't, I couldn't get myself onto the candidates list and do the kind of work they want you to do now on the, on the Conservative list. So I may stand again for 2020, they've asked me to, so it's, it's nice to be asked, but uh, so far no, no political plans in that direction, but I have a, another political film in the works, so that might be my next input. There might be an election before 2020 though, buddy, but it, you better, uh, it's, I mean, funny enough, if you think, everyone's saying how well the Conservatives have done, but because the Liberal Democrats have done so badly, the Conservatives are actually in a weaker position than they were before the election, even though they've increased the number of seats. I think so. I mean, I think, though, that they're not in the same position as they were last time. You know, the, the Liberals have been weakened massively. So I think if there is going to be a coalition, then it's going to be a coalition of, of a hodgepodge of, of uh, opposition parties. So I don't think there's going to be that kingmaker status that the Liberals will have. And, and by the reckoning of tonight's polling, the, uh, the exit poll, Nick Clegg in, in Sheffield Hallam probably won't be um, an MP by this time tomorrow. That's interesting stuff, isn't it? What about open primaries? What do you think they add to the whole mix of things? I think that's fine. You know, something that the Conservatives have, have kind of had some success with. But, um, you know, often it's um, the more you can involve local people in selection, I think it's a good thing. Um, that said, I was a candidate from outside of the area. So when I stood in 2010, I think there was six or seven other people who were from the North East. Um, but I beat them all in the interview by playing to my, my strengths as being an outsider. So, you know, I, I think it's, it's sort of horses for courses, really. If it, if it works, if primaries work for that area, for that selection, then, then I'm all in favour of it. Great stuff. And how late are you staying up tonight? Um, not sure. I mean, it's, I'm hoping to see Middlesbrough in. You know, I'm, I'm hoping Simon Clark's going to punch through and do really well. Um, in 2012, Conservatives did very badly in, in the... In the in the by-election. I think they only got 1,600 seats. So I'm, I'm hopeful that Simon will do well. He's, he's certainly the best candidate there. Um, he's certainly better than the current Labour candidates. 
Um, but um, yeah, I'm going to try and stick it to about two o'clock. Um, I might be a bit of a lightweight and not make it through till 4 a.m. But uh, well, I'll might, do my best. You might not be the only one, I think, buddy. There's a few. Uh, <laughs> we've, uh, we've had an exhausting time here at the Un election trying to get the technological stuff up and going. So are you, have you got a wild party there or are you just uh, on your lonesome watching tonight? Uh, well, I actually saw my mate Steve Nallen in the play Dead Sheep this afternoon at the Park Theatre um, where he plays Margaret Thatcher. It's the Jeffrey Howe play. So that was my little treat for myself. Crazy um, stuff. Seeing Steve in that. So I, I had my party this afternoon. Good um, stuff. The crowd. So can I, can I ask John? We've got, we got a question David coming from our producer TV. here. Uh, Crazy. I, uh, I, think, and I think this will interest you, Dan, because I know, Dan, you're very anti the tribalism of politics. Yes. So tell me about your story you know, Labour background, not even a Conservative Party member, yes. but you stood for, you know, so what were your political views going into that process? Where did you, did it take you, did you become more of a Conservative through doing that? Where, uh, tell, tell us a bit more about your journey, because it's an amazing journey, I think. Um, well, before I made the film, I was making a documentary for Gordon Brown in Downing Street about um, social mobility and young people going to emerging economies of China India and Brazil. It was called the Prime Minister's Global Fellowship and it was a bit of a vanity project for Gordon Brown but it meant that I got to work with the team at Downing Street and at the British Council quite closely and it was quite a fiasco and uh, it's the, 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 the last bit of goodwill I had for, for the Labour Party was, was pretty much spent on that project. Around the same time I was making a homeless series for the BBC called Sofa Surfers. I was on Breakfast News, I was chatting um, to, the, uh, to the host of Breakfast News. When I came out, I went back into the green room. I met some gents in suits who said to me, oh, you spoke rather well there about homelessness. You should think of coming and joining us. And I thought, oh, this must be some religious organization. <laughs> and they said, no, we're, we're the Conservative Party. And uh, I was really quite shocked to be approached and sort of solicited, as it were, by some gents from the Conservative Party. Um, David Cameron was opening up the list to everyone and anyone who wants to be a candidate. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll, I'll give that a go because I'm very interested in politics. As a small business owner, you're running my own TV company, I had sort of conservative with a small C values. So I thought, well, let's, let's give this a try. Would they really want someone like myself who's never been an activist, has always voted Labour? Um, would I even get through the application process? So at the opening stages, I was thinking a bit more of an experiment. Um, when I went for the five-hour selection interview at the Moller Centre in Cambridge, it was more of a psych test. Um, I was amazed. I got onto the list, and within a few weeks, I applied for a seat, Middlesbrough, one of the few that were left, and was selected as a candidate. So it all happened within a five-week sort of time frame. So I was really shocked that you know anyone could, could, could enter the party, um, but it wasn't the case. Other people who thought they'd get through, councillors and and party workers didn't make it through. So I think they like the, the outsider sort of aspects of my profile. I think that's right. I think that's what politics needs is more yeah. people who aren't tribalists. I, I can't understand why people always boast about voting for the same people each time. You've got to change your vote, keep the politicians on their toes. You've got to withhold your, uh, you know, your approval for them from time to time. Otherwise, they'll never change. That's right. But you know, advertisers like tribal people. That's why you find that when advertisers are looking for something new to sell, they'll go to Channel 4, because if you're an 18 to 25 year old, then you are likely to change your brand of toothpaste or mortgage or whatever it might be. If you're over 35 and you're in that older retirement age as well of 65 plus, you won't be changing products. So it's a much harder sell. So tribalism actually plays across all strata of society. So the politics, it's, 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 quite, um, it's quite cancerous, really, because you have a town like Middlesbrough who weren't served well, I believe, by their Labour Party and by their Labour Party MP, and yet, rather than, rather than try someone else, whether Lib Dems, Greens, or UKIP, or even Conservative, they were happy to stick with, with basically a, a, losing, a losing side. But you see that tribalism in sports as well. People will stick with their clubs regardless of their position, you know, moan about it down the pub. But it's something that if you can't break free of that, then you're condemned really, aren't you, to a lifetime of supporting the, the wrong side. Yeah, and I'll take your support for granted. That is true. So, well, Tory boy, I'm, I don't know if you're uh, going to be tribal for the rest of your life, but well done changing. And, uh, and I'm uh, the big lesson here is be less tribal, people. Thank you very much. Um, uh, enjoy uh, the rest of your night. Cheers, thanks. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.
Oh, we got Mark Thompson's about to come on. We got Mark Thompson here. I'm going to tweet this. Yeah, let's call Mark Thompson because he's a dude. Yeah, keep on the tweeting team. Um, let's get Mark Thompson, who is a guy who shot prominence as a blogger and uh, and is now. Oh, you might be joining me right now. Hello. Hey, Mark, how's it going? Good to talk to you again. Yeah. yeah. Can't you hear me? Mark? Uh oh. Connection problem. Can we got a connection problem? I think that's his end. It probably isn't. Yeah, I think yeah. he's got. Let's start again. He's got Mark, dodgy. Mark. He's cutting out, very sorry, he says. So, sorry, Mark, we might not be able to speak to him. Okay, sorry, Mark, well. Should we see who else? Uh, let's try. We've got someone here. Yeah, well, maybe we've lost Mark. Sorry about that. First time voter, that'd be good yeah, to talk Alex to him. We got first time calling him. We got first time voter who wants to come and talk to us. There's what seats one, have? three seats one. Look yeah, at that. Someone keep an eye on our seat. Yeah, I have, yeah. so I have an update. Let's see what's going on. Still on three. Still on three. Still on three. Well, it's all to play for. All to play for at the moment. Look. Is anyone saying when the next result will come through? Yeah, there's a long gap. First time voter is out on the town where he should be. Can we explain? Yikes, does. Yikes, we've got a lot of Skype noise going on around here at the moment. Hello. Hello. Hey, we got Mark Thompson back. Mark, yeah, how, yeah. how are you Hopefully doing? Hopefully it keeps dropping, I don't know why. Mark, hello. Listen, good to yeah. talk to you. What hello. are you making of it? I talked to you earlier this week. I was on your... Uh, Award-winning and very widely respected blog. It's totally brilliant. Um, what do you make of all this? Well, of uh, the, the general the general picture tonight. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, funnily enough, the last two or three days I've been reading a couple of blogs. Uh, one by a, a site I think it's called Number Cruncher, um, and they were predicting actually that the polls were wrong, quite significantly wrong, and it's looking like they have been proved correct in the end it's um it's looking like a very very good night for david cameron and an absolutely disastrous night for everyone else apart from nicholas sturgeon i think well it's that faustian pact between them it obviously worked out very interesting indeed isn't it <laughs> well and of course uh, you know our old friend first past the post is uh, you know delivering uh, great uh, great benefits for nicholas sturgeon and also to an extent david cameron i mean if he he has nearly got a majority on about you know 34 percent of the vote then you know it's doing its job for him but the question is is he weaker now because actually to be honest that libcon no. the libcom coalition worked quite well for him right he could keep his own right wingers in check saying oh i've got to do this because the liberals want me to they had enough mps to bring to the table how is he going to go around now he's got a very very weak minority government oh, he's got a minority potentially in minority government got some weird allies he's got weird people in his own party what's he going to do yeah i mean that's that's a difficult call but in terms of where his political star is at the moment if he has if these polls are right if he has managed to get to 316 seats so increase the number of seats that he's got in parliament the only other person to have done that in recent times is margaret thatcher in 1983 so that would put him in a very very powerful position with the kind of political capital he would then have um and that's it's kind of the way it works, you know, if, you, if you're going up, you're doing well, and although he might struggle to govern in two or three years' time, he'll probably be away after the uh, after the referendum anyway, so he probably won't be too bothered about that, and he can go out on a high, he will hope. Well, of, of, of winning another referendum, because he wants to have a referendum in Europe, but he says he wants to win it and stay in Europe, doesn't he? That's right, and I mean, that could split his party. But, you know, all that talk about him staying on for five years, I don't believe a word of it. I think as soon as the referendum is over, he'll hand over to Boris or to Theresa. But, I mean, tonight, you can't, you can't take it away from him. If these polls are right, he has done something that's actually quite remarkable to have gone from, you know, a minority government with a coalition that hadn't been done in this country for 60 or 70 years um, to actually increase the number of his seats. And look at the absolute decimation that the Lib Dems are suffering from that just it really shows you you know you see this in other countries junior junior partners uh, you know get punished but usually it's under proportional systems so even though they lose out they might only lose you know 20 or 30 of their MPs if this is right Lib Dems are going to lose 80 plus percent of their MPs a massively disproportionate punishment for what they've done which really I mean I used to be a Lib Dem so you might say I'm a bit biased but I do think they stepped up to, to help govern the country at a time of national crisis and this is the thanks that they get 
it's going to discourage anyone else from getting in any any uh, coalitions anytime soon, isn't it? I would imagine so. I, I would certainly, I would certainly imagine that any uh, you know junior coalition partner in the future will uh, you know be looking at what happened to the Lib Dems and be very, very wary. I would imagine confidence and supply is going to be the uh, you know is going to be the order of the day for many years to come for junior partners. And if these polls are right, I suspect Cameron will just try and rule as a minority and dare the rest of them to vote him down with the the perceived mandate that he has. What uh, what about the Lib Dems? What I mean, who knows how many of them there'll be? What what do they do? Do they go on supporting Cameron, or do they just uh, well? Who knows what do they do? I cannot see that they will go on supporting Cameron in any kind of coalition. If they're down to ten, well, for a start, either Clegg will lose his seat on ten. If he doesn't lose his seat, he'll be kicked out as leader. There's no way you can lose eighty plus percent of your seats and, and survive as leader. And so it will be someone like Tim Farron. I mean, Tim Farron will be one of these cockroaches, won't he? You know, who survived the nuclear war because he he is so so well in, in his uh, Cumbrian seat that he isn't going anywhere. So it may well be him, and he's quite left leaning. But I imagine. They need to go into opposition and lick their wounds and try and rebuild, and it could take them a political generation. Um, I, mean, it is, I think it is quite sad to see, because I think even people who perhaps thought the coalition wasn't great would agree that, that this, they didn't deserve this level of punishment. Um, and yeah, I, I just, I, who knows? The cards have all been thrown up again. The tectonic plates have shifted massively, to use John Prescott's phrase. So I think we'll just have to wait and see on that. But um, yeah, I can't see them going into another coalition. Well, that's great stuff. As always, Mark, you are a brilliant guide through the uh, the dark woods of our political system. Thank you very much. Um, and what time will you Thank be you. up to? Sorry? Will you be up all night? I will be. I'm actually at the uh, the cats in, um, in Thanet, so where uh, Nigel Farage is hoping to win a seat. And I have to say, from the, uh, the couple of chats I've had with people, I've not been here long, but um, it's not looking good. The Tories think that they uh, they've done very well. I think from what I'm hearing, they may well take the seat. Labour may even have come second. Farage might be pushed into third place. And if that happens, then, you know, it's all over here. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, that bombshell. On, the, the, on that bombshell, the Kent broadband has let us down. Ah, oh, come on, Kent. The end well, that, of Farage. The end of Farage. Is that the end? If, so if Farage has lost his seat, Farage, is that the end of UKIP? If Farage lost his seat, uh, Farage... Well, I mean, it's the end of UKIP, arguably, anyway, isn't it, if the Tories win, because they have agreed to this referendum, this in-out referendum. So, who knows? Who knows? But, yeah, I think I think it's the end of Farage. And you've got to say, without Farage, I'm not sure UKIP are up to much. That's my uh, inexpert opinion on this unelection. Um, right. What's next? Let's talk to a first-time voter. I like to talk to a first-time voter. He's contacted us through our website. Great. Do you know why the difference between the poll and, and this? It's amazing, isn't it? But, but how come? Do you, what, what, what has yeah, happened? I've got it. I do, well, I don't know. So this is Alex. Alex, is can you hear me? In Scotland and a first-time voter. Can you see me? Can you hear me? Alex, can, I, can you hear me? I can hear you not very well. Oh, there you are. Um, I can see it now. Why can't Alex we hear Alex? Loud. Alex, can you turn your mic up uh, or speak closer to it or something? Because you're super quiet. Okay. Uh, how's this? It's still really quiet. Let's boost it on our, at our end. We're boosting at our end. Yeah, let me, I need to boost it here as well. Alex, how are you doing? Uh, I'm great, thanks. How are you? Oh no, that's still a bit too quiet, I'm afraid. Yeah, say, say something, Alex. Ooh, strangely, Alex, we haven't. We, we can see you perfectly. It's a good connection, but we can't hear you. Oh, okay. Yeah. We, we very slightly hear you. It's very and it's very quiet on the broadcast as well. I Let's think. try. Afraid. Is it? Can you like shout into the mic? Alex, try shout at the top of your voice. Okay. Yeah. Uh, how's this for volume? That's, That's good. Fantastic. Keep shouting even louder. Oh, okay. Okay, we're gonna go with that. If you, I'm sorry, you're gonna wear your voice out. First of all, where are you? Uh, I'm in Edinburgh right now, uh, quite close to the centre, not that far from Holyrood itself. Okay, and so you voted for the first time? I did, yeah. And what's the vibe up there? Is the, what's the SMP tidal wave feel like from up there? <laughs> in the university, it's surprisingly weak. Uh, the recent survey that we had said that only 13% were going for it. But as a nation, it's really exciting. Um, you know, you, you can see banners everywhere, you can see... Uh, 
and you can see quite a lot of vocal support, even in Edinburgh, which is quite surprising. Uh, and how many students were were mo like mobilised in this election? Were they excited, or or was it pretty quiet on campus? I would say a lot of students were mobilised. Although I guess our sort of mobilisation was generally on social media, and much less in the physical world. Yeah, that's to see something like the Facebook um, "I Voted" thing just fill every newsfeed was really exciting. It's not something I would have expected. And how old are you? Oh, I'm nineteen. And so you've never voted. Did you vote in the referendum? Were you at uni last September? Uh, I was, but I think I missed the mark for being able to vote in the referendum by, by two or three weeks. Okay, so this is your first vote. What's it feel like, buddy? It's exciting. It was. It was absolutely. Um, I, um, <laughs> it, it, it's... <laughs> it's difficult to describe, as you can probably tell. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a it's it's an abstract thing. It's just it's a cool feeling, and I think it's a feeling that a lot of students are like enjoy from the sounds of the discussions we've had, from the sounds of um, uh, from the sounds of debates ranging over social media. Nice one. Alice, keep keep shouting. Keep you shouting. Shout. You're doing well. There, there was We're... a poll, wasn't there? You, uh, you told me about a poll of students. Yeah. Uh, how where, how, how do people vote Scot in your university? English do you think? versus Scottish students. It's an interesting divide. The university is very international and is split maybe evenly between English and Scottish students. So a lot of people have been postal voting this, this time around. And what do you think, how did it break down? Do you think Scottish students, were, do you have different voting profiles or is it all just coming down to the issues that you have in common? Um, a lot of the time it's issues that we have in common. Um, Scottish universities have generally demonstrates quite strong Labour support, quite strong Green support. Um, Edinburgh, maybe a little less SNP, and one of the only unions to vote Green in the majority. But there is a sense of solidarity among students, I'm not sure. At the same time, there are quite a lot of Tory votes, it's something that I personally wasn't expecting, but um, which has been quite interesting. What subject are you doing? I'm doing history. That is a good, I'm glad to hear that. That's an excellent <laughs> subject there. Well done, you. Um, well, um, Alex, just tell us one thing. Your, your younger sister, too young to vote, but she's involved, is that right? What's your younger sister doing? She's counting votes at the moment, back uh -huh. home in Stratford-upon-Avon. Stratford so there, did you know that you could be too young to vote? I did not you know. you count votes? I didn't know you could be too young to vote, but you can count votes, but you can also be too young to vote and fight in, in, and join the army. Which, so there's lots of things oh, you can do. Good. Um, okay, well that's very good. Stratford on Avon. That is is that in that Lib Dem seat there? What is that? What what seat is that? What who's Dem seat? That? Oh, it's Conservative. Okay, well that'll probably stay there. Okay, not lovely. Well, thank you very much. Get back to your wild student partying, buddy. <laughs> thank you. There you go. Eh? Look at that. The future is in safe hands. Safe hands, I tell you, with folk like that. Um, what a what a nice guy. Now, unless we've got something else, let's go to video so I can go and have a bit of water, chill out, stretch the old legs. Let's have another, uh, let's play that one that we, we mucked up earlier. Okay, we're going to play one that we mucked up earlier. Um, I'm not sure which that is, could be several. It was about, uh, it was about yeah. why people who don't vote don't vote, wasn't it? Oh yeah, that was really nice, yeah, why people who don't vote don't vote. vote. And Jay, we, who joined us earlier, he actually might be in an election party, which we could see if he, we could Skype in. He, he will be sober, I think. Uh, I think he will be sober. Vote. He was uh, hoping for a green or labour surge in his area. He may well be sober. He may be very sober. Okay, stay tuned for more unelection action after the video. So, you're one of the 42% of people in the UK who don't intend to vote in this year's general election. Fair enough, maybe you're less than 18 years old, in which case your time will come. Or maybe you're in prison. Or maybe you're the Queen. If you're the Queen, it's your Parliament and you're not allowed to vote. That still leaves a whopping 13 million people who are eligible to vote, but have said they're not going to. The press call it voter apathy, 
But that term implies that non-voters are lazy people who would rather stay in bed than walk five minutes to the polling station. The truth is even sadder. A lot of people are informed, passionate and clued up, but have chosen for their own reasons not to join in. What legitimate, decent, well-thought-out reasons could they possibly have? It's fun to fantasize and imagine that your one vote could tip the balance and change the result of a general election. Realistically, of course, that never happens, except one time in 1910 when Henry Duke Baron Merivale won the seat of Exeter by a margin of one. Much more likely, you live in a constituency that's nowhere near as marginal as that, and it's pretty obvious who's going to win. We have a far from perfect first past the post process for picking future politicians, and it can feel like it's f***ing pointless. This is especially true if you like one of the smaller parties best. And that brings us to reason number one why people don't vote. My favourite has no chance. OK, fine, fine. Maybe, maybe you can't change who your MP is going to be. But you can change their behaviour. How? The way parties behave in government is down to far more than just the election results. It's down to the election details. The morning after the general election, all the stats of how many voters voted for whom and where are there to be seen on the internet and the party leaders are watching very carefully. Every vote for a small party is a vote taken away from one of the big ones, and the big ones will do everything they can to try to win you back. Don't believe me? Just look at the Green Party. Before the recent surge of support for the Greens, Labour had no intention of renationalising the rail network, but afterwards they did. Where do you suppose they got that idea? It's the same for purple patriotic pound-pushing potty mouths UKIP. The more votes anti-immigration party UKIP get, the more Labour and the Tories move immigration up the agenda. Well done, UKIP voters. Perhaps it's not the smallness of your party that's stopping you from voting. Perhaps it's the opposite. Could it be you're not voting because... My favourite's going to win anyway! Well, it seems really obvious, but what if everyone thought the same as you? Let's say everyone in your constituency thought your MP was really safe and there was no need to vote. Think that can't happen? It's exactly what happened in 1997 to Government Minister Michael Portillo in 1997 when he famously lost his so-called safe seat. <laughs> also, there's a big difference between winning by miles and winning by a hair's breadth. If your MP gets a thumping majority, they'll be more confident about their convictions. And presumably, if you like them, that's what you want. On the other hand, if they just scrape in, they'll be forced to compromise and pander to voters who never liked them in the first place. So you see? First past the post is far from perfect, but there is no such thing as a wasted vote. That's so important, I'll say it again. There is no such thing as a wasted vote. Maybe it's not the counting system that's putting you off. Maybe, and I'm sorry to say this is the most popular reason of all, your reason is... I HATE ALL OF THEM! For many people, after reading all the manifestos and watching all the party political broadcasts and browsing all the party websites and enduring all the TV debates, they've decided that not a single one of the parties speaks to them, and they don't even unhate the least worse one enough to give them a tactical vote. If this is you, rather than remove your voice completely, why not do something that's more productive and more fun? You can vote none of the above. In some countries, that's actually a box you can tick, but in Britain, you do this by spoiling your ballot. The rules of the ballot box are strict. You put an X and nothing else to make sure that there's no chance of error or fraud. If you put a tick, or colour the box in, or rate the candidates out of 10, or correct the spelling of the candidates' names, or put your own name and vote for yourself, or put your own name and vote for someone else, or write the lyrics to the Stonecutter song from The Simpsons, that's called a spoilt ballot and it won't be valid. But it will be counted. Politicians will see the none of the above votes, and they're much more likely to try and win you over, and much more likely to try and fix the system if you've bothered to go out and vote. Spoiling your ballot is an absolute worst case scenario, last, 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 last resort, but it's so much better than not voting at all. It's totally understandable why people think that there's no point in voting, but if you do go out and vote, there is one thing that you're absolutely guaranteed. When you and your friends are bitterly complaining that the country's been piddled up the doo-wop by a prime minister you hate and a party you can't stand, you can at least take solace in the ability to smugly shrug and say, well, it wasn't our fault.
So he's up in there, up in Inverness. Hey, the audio. hey sorry, we're back. Uh, we've internet is reporting that uh, we've lost Ben. Uh, Ben's gone. 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 Ben's
Hi, I'm Peter Botting, and I actually exist! Do you want to survive the next election? Are you positively petrified of being powerfully pummeled in a partisan political probing? I can make you bulletproof! One, don't like the question? Change it to a different question. Well, I think what we should be asking is... Two, use vague yet committal vocabulary! Look, let me be clear, interviewer's name. Robust plan. Three, imply that the interviewer is too stupid to understand the real answer. Well, that's a really complicated question and we don't have all day, so let me try and explain it simply. Four, change the subject and talk about something dreadful your opponents have done. Let me just change the subject and talk about something dreadful our opponents have done. And finally, five, give an answer that's so confusing, nobody knows if you've said anything at all. Well, I'm glad you've raised that question, interviewer's name, so let me be clear. This is an issue that we're very concerned about, and it's about time that we stopped dithering, got round the negotiating table, got it sorted, got this right, stopped getting it wrong, and made sure that this issue doesn't get raised again, at least not during the course of our government, without asking permission first. Um, look, it's important we have a robust response. And here's the thing. The argument, James, I'm putting is this. That's not kind of the issue. The, the issue is if we sort of stand back and look at the big picture. So stop making sense and save your skin. Call today! It's a real pity that this man and several more like him exist slash exist. But the reason that he and his clients are so successful is because these tricks keep them out of trouble. Demonstrably. Just look at this graph. We have to face the fact that in a media increasingly driven by sound bites, where everything you say lasts forever, politicians are never going to give straight answers. Their job security matters more than their job being done effectively. So, what's the solution? There isn't one. It's naive to assume that we're owed a solution to this awful, worsening, inherently unsolvable problem. That's it. Bye. You know, it is just these as, as one swing to one could. Here we go, we're waiting for. We need you. Come back. Come back. We might need to do a little periscope. Um. Okay. Yes, not a periscope.